Thank you very much for the gracious introduction and even more for providing me with this uh, opportunity to speak with folks who are part of the FIRE community. I am um, delighted to be here and I'd like to spend my time offering three pieces of advice. So I'm going to speak for a while, offer my advice, and then we'll have a bit of time afterwards for uh, questions and the airing of objections. First, I think that as you proceed with your mission, and it's a wonderful mission, actually, if we think of this gathering as ambassadors for freedom of expression, ambassadors for the protection of due process, ambassadors for individual rights, you're going to confront various problems, difficulties. You're going to confront controversy. There is going to be struggle. And my first piece of advice is that you need to pay a lot of attention to the way in which you wage those struggles. One thing that you need to do is be very attentive to the way in which you interact with adversaries. Now, I'm going to go autobiographical here. I come to you. Um, I am not, I, I, I've known about FIRE throughout its existence, in large part because uh, I've known Harvey Silverglate for, for decades, one of the founders of, of FIRE, and he's been a He's been a colleague and a, and a, and a friend. And um, we've talked about lots and lots of things. And there have been occasions on which I have not been a fire poster person at all. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. In the 1980s, um, there was an occasion at, at, at my home university, Harvard. I, I, it was about, I think it was probably the third or fourth year I was there. There was an episode in which uh, a diplomat from the South African, a, a South African diplomat came to the university to speak. He was, the, he was invited there by the conservative club. And this was when South Africa was an apartheid regime. And there were a group of students that disrupted the diplomat's speech. And these students were condemned widely. These students were disciplined. And around that time, I was asked to give a talk on campus. And I did give a talk. And I applauded the students. And I made an argument that under certain circumstances, it was perfectly proper to disrupt a speaker. Um, at that time, by the way, Harvey Silverglate was the president of the Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. And I was on the board of the Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. And I got a call in the evening, because there was a lot of press coverage about this. And I got a call, and, and Harvey said, well, Randy, I read the press coverage. Is this accurate? And I said, yep, it's accurate. And he said, well, you know, I strongly disagree, and I'm writing a couple of letters. I'm writing a letter to the student newspaper. I'm writing a letter to the Boston Globe. I'm writing a couple of letters saying that, you know, uh, you know, the Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts really disagrees very strongly with the position you take. In fact, your position is antithetical to our position. I said, I, okay. And for a couple of weeks, there was a back and forth. Nat Hintoff took after me in the Washington Post. 
Uh, it was a real hubbub. That was one. Now, in question and answer, I'll be happy to talk with you about, you know, the, the circumstances and the view. I held, by the way, to that position and wrote about it for a good long time. I've changed my mind on that, by the way. But for a good long time, I held my, I, that, that was the position that I held. Uh, that's, that's one example. Um, there was a more recent example. In the past few years, I'd say, you know, case by case by case, I would generally be on the side of fire with respect to various controversies on campus. But I generally took the position that fire was being alarmist with respect to the question of censorship, to the question of repression, to the, 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 the claims it was making about conformity. I thought that it was sort of exaggerating. And Greg will tell you, I, I told him. It's not like I was hiding it. I, I would say this. I said, you know, yeah, but you know, come on. There, you know, there, there are thousands of campuses. There are thousands of, of universities in the United States. 10 examples, even 20 examples. You know, it's a big country. What's characteristic versus an outlier? I think that you guys are making outliers seem as though they're characteristic. I've changed my mind on that too. And we can talk about that. But what's the point that I want to make? The point that I want to make is that I have been in disagreement, sometimes very strong disagreement, public disagreement, pointed disagreement with people in fire. But I'm here tonight. And one of the reasons that I'm here tonight, one of the reasons that I've changed my mind about various things, is because in my disagreement, folks at FIRE with whom I disagreed disagreed with me in a way that allowed us to keep talking, disagreed with us me in a way that actually facilitated a change of mind. And as you go forth, remember that. Now, you know, there's no use in being sentimental. There's no use in being naive. Some folks that you're going to interact with know their minds are not going to be changed. Let's just get that straight. But there are an appreciable number of people who are going to be persuadable. And you need to work on figuring out ways to disagree with people in a way that leaves them open to persuasion. By the way, you need to be open to persuasion too. So, you know, it's not, nobody has a lock on the truth forever. But in your interaction with people, don't make enemies out of people who, at a given point in time, are merely adversaries. So it seems to me that's a very important point. When you're dealing with people, assume good faith and argue from there. I'm not saying be, you know, namby-pamby. Make your point, make your point strongly, make your point vividly. But don't demean people. Don't needlessly alienate people. Make it so that you can argue with someone and that make, make it so that that person the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, argue with the, that person in a way such that they can come back. There's another point, corollary point, in these various struggles, there are going to be you all. There's going to be you know, the, 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 the ambassadors of freedom of expression. And you are going to be interacting with activists 
of various sorts that are going to be propounding a, you know, a different point of view. You know, you're going to have the activists over here and the activists over here. Does that complete the scene? No, it does not. There is going to be a much larger group of people. Who is the much larger group of people? Onlookers. People who are going to wander onto the scene. You're going to be saying your thing. Your opponent's going to be saying your thing. There are going to be people who are just going to be wandering up. They're not going to know, what, you know what's what. They're just going to wander up. They're seeing this. They're going to watch. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't know. They, they don't have a strong point of view. They're going to be watching. They're going to be making immediately, however, judgments. We can't help but make judgments. And they're going to be asking things like, well, I don't know. They're going to be listening. Who is presenting themselves in a way that gives me confidence? Who is presenting themselves in a way that's sort of, you know, attractive? Who looks like they are a rational person? Who looks like they're acting in a way that they're a person that actually I'd like to talk with them? If you are acting like a jackass, no, I'm serious. If you are acting in a way that needlessly alienates people, that's not going to do anything good for our cause. You need to be very attentive to the people who are watching, especially now. Especially now. Because now, frankly, in any controversy that you're part of, you can assume that what you're saying is being taped. You can assume that how you're appearing is going to be known to lots of people through video. And if you are comporting yourself in a bad way, in an unattractive way, that's going to redound against our cause. Be attentive to that. Okay, let me go to my second thing. My second thing has to do with race. Now, in a lot of campuses, if we're talking about freedom of expression and controversies about freedom of expression, race and racial conflict is going to play a big part. Just like everything else in American life. I mean, the race question is everywhere else in American life. Why wouldn't it be part of this? It is part of this. If one thinks about, for instance, you know, speech codes, at the heart of the speech codes, you know, so-called hate speech, many of the controversies, many of the most intense controversies on campuses having to do with due process, having to do with freedom of expression, have involved racial issues. So let's talk about race in this. My impression is that on a lot of campuses you have the champions of racial justice, all too often arrayed against the champions of freedom of expression. That need not be. We're so used to it now, we're so used to it that people have sort of gotten acclimatized to it. They sort of expect it. And it's had some bad consequences. It's had some bad consequences. Many, many uh, campuses I've gone to, in the ranks of people who are really champions of freedom of expression, I have seen in many campuses a real dearth of people of color. 
And like I said, I've seen there be a, this sort of a, a butting of heads. Need not be that way. Now, there are reasons for it. But one of the things that I think has um, facilitated needless adversariness between the champions of freedom of expression and the champions of racial justice is a lack of historical perspective. Greg, I was very happy that in one of your, uh, you know, in, in, in one of your slides, Frederick Douglass. So let's take a look at American history. Let's ask the question. Let's ask the question. You take a look at the champions of freedom of expression. Where have the champions of freedom of expression been with respect to the race question? In the 19th century, easy. Before 1865, who were the champions of freedom of expression? The abolitionists. My favorite, well, Frederick Douglass, my ultimate favorite. William Lloyd Garrison, thrown in jail. If one asks the following question, when, when in the history of the United States was there the most repression? The, the slave South. Against the law for abolitionist, abolitionist literature to be disseminated. The campuses in the slave South against the law to question slavery. Push it further. Go to Reconstruction. One of the reasons why radical Reconstructionists wanted to put limits on state power vis-a-vis -vis due process, vis-a-vis -vis freedom of expression, was because of the memory of the old slave South and then what occurred during Reconstruction. If one brings it to the 20th century, who were the champions of freedom of expression? Take a look. Take a look at who the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People were. Take a look at them and where they stood with respect to the race question. If one takes a look at the early champions of the American Civil Liberties Union, where did they stand with respect to the race question? If we flip it around and ask, well, what about the champions of racial justice in the United States? Where have they stood? Okay, F Frederick Douglass. In the 20th century, here's a point that is directly pertinent to the mission of fire. Question, when did the courts of the United States first recognize that students at public institutions had a right to due process, a right to freedom of expression under the First Amendment? What were the seminal cases? In the 1960s, in the Deep South, black students fighting segregation, those were the students that brought the federal constitution to the campuses. If we look to the first case, the, 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 the clearest case, Dixon versus Alabama State Education system. Here's what happened. February 1960, group of students inspired by the sit-ins began in 
North Carolina, group of students in Montgomery, Alabama sat in at a um, segregated grill in, of all places, the courthouse. They sat in. They were not arrested, but they were told to leave, and they left. But the police knew that these were students at Alabama State College, the black school. The governor of the state demanded to know who the students were and got their names, called up the president of the, of the, of the college, and said, I want you to expel these students. These students received a letter saying the following, you are expelled, not there's some charges that are being uh, presented against you, no, no, you know, show up at a hearing, no, 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 uh-uh, you are expelled. These students fought this. And to show you the state of the law at this moment, this is early 1960s, this is happening 60, 61, 62. Those students were on the losing end. At the district court level, a very fine district court judge, Frank Johnson, one of the heroes of the second reconstruction in the, in, the, in the federal judiciary, ruled against the students because the state of the law in 1960 was that if you were at a school, you had no rights, no federal constitutional rights. Frank Johnson said, listen, you know, you waived all your rights. You came to the school, the school can do what it wants. It can turn you out for whatever reason. And they don't even have to give you a hearing. They don't have to even give you notice. The case went up on appeal, and on appeal, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, Judge Reeves writing for the majority, and it was a split opinion, two to one, but Judge Reeves writing for the majority said, you know what, students should at least have a right to notice in a hearing, that was the beginning. The struggle for racial justice has been the seedbed for many of the points of progress in American democracy, and it was true here. Let me go to another case. You mentioned and you showed the Tinker case. And the Tinker case is a very well-known case. I mean, when people think about, especially with high school students, when people think about, you know, what, what, what was the beginning of um, constitutional protection for freedom of expression for students, especially high school students, you know, a well-trained lawyer in the United States is expected to say Tinker. I mean, if I was taking the bar exam and I saw a Tinker, that's what I would, you know, put in. Actually, it wasn't the first. It was not the first. And in fact, when you read Tinker, you will, the Supreme Court cites earlier cases. The Supreme Court ratified earlier cases. Where did these earlier cases come from? They came from Mississippi. Byers versus Burnside. Group of black students, high school students, went to school with a button, the button representing the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It had a black hand and a white hand shaking. Principal says, you can't wear that button. And if you wear that, bu if you wear that button, just go home. Students went home, got lawyers, fought the case. Court said, you know, again, it was Fifth Circuit. Court said, students aren't bothering anybody. They got a little button on, but, you know, it's not interfering with teaching at the school. Students should have a right, even, in, even high school students should have a right to be able to express themselves, you know, in such a way that so long as they're not interfering with the principal mission of the school. 
That was three years before Tinker. There is no necessary conflict between the struggle for racial justice in the United States and freedom of expression. And I think that that message needs to get out. People need to be talking about this. And on various campuses, it's gotten so that, you know, people are so siloed. I would urge you, when you go to your various campuses, talk, look at these cases. Have a discussion about this. The camp of freedom of expression needs to be a large camp with a lot of people in it. Need to work on that. I would say don't run away from the race issue. Talk about it. And when, and when there are conflicts, fine. Talk about the conflicts. But don't exaggerate the conflicts. Again, over the course of American history, the champions of freedom of expression have been among the most ardent champions of racial justice. Let me go to a third point. Third point has to do with politics. Third point has to do with politics. And I come to this point Again, autobiographically, I'm a person on the left. Probably to the left of liberalism. Let me just be very clear about this. I'm a person on the left. So, you know, you think, well, eh, you know, be, be, be more, more specific. I'm, I'm a person, I've, you know, for, for years and years and years, I've written for, used to be on the editorial, you know, board of um, the nation that gives you a sense of things. Written for, used to be on the editorial board of Dissent Magazine. Uh, written for, still I'm on the editorial board, American Prospect. If one were to ask, you know, where do you stand with respect to, you know, tax policy or foreign affairs or this or that or the other. I think you know, most people would put me you know, pretty far on the left wing of things. I'm fine. That's where I am. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, there's no hiding of the ball. That's, that's where I am. Now, um, and here, I guess I'm speaking, you know, I would, I would assume in an audience like this, there's a wide range of, you know, folks, but one thing that's really bothered me in the last, it's been a while now, it, you know, it, probably two decades, has to do with my ideological camp, my ideological camp on the left. When I was growing up, whatever else you wanted to say about the left, the left had a tremendous asset. The left was the place where your poets, your songwriters, your movie makers, your misfits, people who were feeling the pressure of conformity, the people who were running from repression, they headed for the left. That was the tent where they could find some support. That was the tent where they could at least not worry about being bothered. You know, do your thing. I'm serious. One thinks about, you know, if, if one thinks about obscenity prosecutions, if one thinks about the, 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 the history of comedy,
the left. And it was an asset. Unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, my sense is that that asset has been, there's, there's been a squandering of that asset. And one of the things that I do in my work, you know, writing and talking, organizing, it's mainly writing and talking. I'm not that much of an organizer, to tell you the truth. But I, I say to my friends on the left that we need to, to, to work double time to restore that asset. This was a heck of an asset. Now, let me say something about the, let me say something to my conservative friends. And I'm not being facetious, I have conservative friends. I do. And to my conservative friends, I say the following. Now, it's an interesting thing, the way that things work out. And this sort of ties back to my first point about people changing their minds. If one takes a look at the conservative movement, if one takes a look at the origins, for instance, take a look at the National Review. Take a look at the biography of William F. Buckley. William F. Buckley, God and Man at Yale. It's largely an attack on freedom of expression at college campuses. I got to give it to the conservative movement, though. Over time, they listened up. And there has been a change of mind. Now, sometimes, again, no, you, let's not be sentimental. Sometimes it's opportunistic. You know, sometimes I, I, mean, I talk with you know, my conservative friends, and I say, you know what? The only time that uh, it seems as though you get in a huff about freedom of expression is when uh, you know, people in my ideological tent are acting a fool and being repressive. That's the only time when you get upset about things. You know, when people, when, when, when people on the right are repressing my folks, you somehow are asleep. Now that, that, that's, you know, there's opportunism over there. But there has also been a real, authentic, and I think deep-seated change of mind among a you know, considerable number of conservatives. And you know, I, I give a salute. Persuasion. So those are my three, I, those, those are my three suggestions. People in my ideological camp left, let's recapture this asset that used to be so securely in our grip. Second, let's be attentive, more attentive, let's educate ourselves, let's talk about the race issue and talk about and understand and appreciate the way in which these two streams have, for the most part, been in synergy with one another as opposed to been in, you know, in any sort of antagonistic relationship. And to go back to point number one, let's conduct our struggle in a way that wins people over. Now, I just want to say one last thing in leaving. A last point and then questions and objections and let's, you know, discuss. I really do want to emphasize my really deep appreciation and admiration for FIRE. I was talking with my uh, colleague sitting next to me, we were talking about colleges. And I was saying that, you know, colleges and universities, we, we, we grow up around them, we're around them, you know, we're, you know they're sort of, 
we're all too used to them to tell you the truth. Because we're so used to them, we take them for granted. These colleges, your colleges and universities, each and every one of them, absolutely precious as institutions. And we need to work hard to protect them. And there is nothing more vital about our colleges and universities than them being places where people can think and discuss and disagree. That is absolutely central. And it is precious. It is fragile. And I am so happy that FIRE is, you know, dedicated to doing what it can to advance that struggle. And I'm really happy to see you all, young people, who are headed towards that. That is very, very, very important. One person that I, I mentioned at the very beginning, and I'm going to mention him finishing, was the co-founder of FIRE, Harvey Silverglade. I know Harvey Silverglate because Harvey Silverglate lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's a criminal defense lawyer there. He's civil libertarian. I've known him now for over three decades. We agree sometimes. We disagree sometimes. Absolutely extraordinary person. Absolutely extraordinary. as far as I'm concerned, stands for the very best in American democracy. And that is true. That is true, again, of many of the people who are stalwarts in the struggle for freedom of expression. You're going to hear another one tomorrow night, Nadine Strawson. And another example. Nadine Strawson, for a long time, president of the American Civil Liberties Union, I assume that tomorrow night, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what she's going to be saying, but I, I bet it's going to be largely about freedom of expression. I know Nadine Strawson through her work on native, of, of freedom of expression, but I know her even more through her work on behalf of racial justice. I'll never forget. 33 years ago, I was part of a, a, a debate. She was my debating partner. We were, to, we were in a debate about, you know, racial things. Gave one of, I mean, absolutely thrilling performance. Absolutely. If one thinks of, you mentioned in introducing me, Thurgood Marshall, that's right. One of the great joys of my life was working for Mr. Civil Rights, the great Thurgood Marshall. As far as I'm concerned, the greatest lawyer in the history of the United States, bar none. There was no jurist in the history of the United States who was a more dedicated champion of freedom of expression than Thurgood Marshall, Mr. Civil Rights. And one could go on with people who are part of this community who have dedicated themselves to the protection of due process, dedicated themselves to individual rights, dedicated themselves to freedom of expression, and other central features of American democracy as well. You are part of a wonderful community. I hope that you will contribute to that community. And I look forward very much to seeing the fruit of your efforts in the weeks and months and years to come. Thank you very much.